I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I try to read some emails and answer questions. People who write in want to know what things mean. I've spent a lot of time studying Bible. I started studying when I was 17, back in 1956. I began to pray, Lord, help me find the truth. And uh, I heard a professor from a seminary teach, and all this information came out of his mouth, and I thought, I need to learn that. That was 67 years ago. I'm just, and I'm still learning constantly. If you think you've learned it all, no scholar, no professor in the world has ever learned it all out of the Bible. It's God's unbelievable, infallible Word. And uh, I get these letters, and uh, I got a, I get these emails from all over the world. We get some from Australia and from Holland and from South America and, and from Africa and so forth, and all over the country. And I got a letter from Virginia and Florida, and she says, "Hello again. I watched message 17 or 1873." predestination, and when I watched it again, you were saying, hate your brother, sister, and mother. I didn't say that. God said that. Jesus said that. In fact, you want to know where it is? Look in Luke, the 14th chapter. You have to understand the context of something. This is talking about a man inviting people to a fellowship and a feast. Of course, with us, that would be a feast of the Word of God. And they begin to make all these excuses. One says, I have bought a plot of ground and I've got to go plow it. Another one says, I've got to... Uh, I've I've got a new wife, and she won't let me come to Grace and Truth Ministries. And they give all these excuses for not eating of the Word of God. And then the Bible says, concerning these people that refuse to eat the Word of God, it says, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, what's it talking about? It's talking about hating those people that do not want to eat of the word of God and truth. That's what it's talking about. Don't act like I said that. This is in red letters. This is Jesus' words. Then and his own life also. You have to hate the outer man that refuses to eat of the word of God. He cannot be my disciple. Mathetes, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. He cannot be a learner. You can't learn, therefore you can't obey. And then he goes on to say, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and crucify mother, father, sister, brother, and himself also, and come after me, cannot be my learner, my disciple. That's what a disciple is. It's a learner. That's what the word means. Methodist means a learner. So don't get mad at me because something Jesus said. I had a shirt on one day at the doctor's office, and it said, I've still got the shirt, and it said, most people are going to hell when they die. And a woman looked at it, and she's in her 60s. She said, what are you talking about? I said, you act like I said that. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. He said, Jesus said, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. Because wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in there at. I said, most people, many people are going to hell. She said, well, why did you put that on the front of your t-shirt instead? I said, I did. I just paraphrased it. This is what it says. And she just went, uh, grunted and walked away. <laughs> people don't like it when you get blunt with them. Anyway, Virginia, I hope that'll help you.
Andy Dill from West Texas. Pastor Jim, I have listened to somewhere around 2,000 of your videos. Well, good for you. In the past year and a half or so, the truth is hard. You're right. Thank you for the years of study you've done. It has opened up the scripture for me so much. There are so few who actually believe the truth. So many that I talk to like the words and study, but just will not let go of the false beliefs. A lot of people know Christmas is paganism, but they won't let it go. They already have like water baptism, accept Christ, and so forth. I know all is working out the way God planned it from beginning through, so that gives me peace. Rebecca Rogers and her brother David live here on the property with me in Luke, Texas. As you know, David has been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. He is dropping weight very rapidly, and I believe the Lord will be taking him soon. He is our brother, and we'll miss him very much. God's will be done. I have been working lots of work to be done on a different trailer for Rebecca to live in. I talked to Rebecca yesterday. She's her water heater doesn't work, and we bought her a new one. For some reason, it's out of kelter, and I told her if she would get a, a, a plumber out there and check it out, I'll send her the money to get it repaired. Instead of the motorhome she is in right now so that she can get in and out of it with a wheelchair and walk her on her own, I just want to thank you for all the help you have given her and David, it means so much. Thank you for the DVDs. I hand them out in hopes that someone will watch and actually see and hear. Agape and flail to you, Jim, Mary, and all at Grace and Truth Ministries. Sincerely, Andy Dill in West Texas. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. We love you, brother. Keep writing. Then James in East China, Michigan. Jim, I heard a man speaking about a book called The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis. Is this a worthy read? I don't have any idea. There are hundreds and hundreds of books that I haven't read by predestination believers. I don't know about C.S. Lewis. He wrote a lot of a lot of fiction, and I'm not crazy about people who write fiction. He wrote about the lion and the, maybe some of y'all know what he wrote. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Huh? The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. The lion what? The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. I don't particularly care when C.S. Lewis writes that stuff. Why don't he write things about truth? I don't remember if I heard Jim mention the book or the author. Thank you for your time. James in East China, Michigan. I have not read that book. And if I start reading it and it gets into a bunch of a bunch of fairy tales, I'm not going to recommend it. I'd have to read at it. I'd have to read the first three or four pages to find out if I believe what he said. Uh, Daniel in Florida. Hello. Thank you so much for answering my question about getting married. And rather or not, you could be married in God's eyes. Well, not without... You, you can live with somebody and you can call that a marriage and it's not. The man or the woman can leave when they get ready and whoever owns the property takes it with them. There has to be a split of property, and you've got to have a bill of divorce. I, you, besides that, you're not going to look right in the eyes of the world, but not in governments. I just want to let you know that we really appreciate you and your explanation about why we get married makes a lot of sense about why we should be married so as not to leave the open, the other person high and dry. That's exactly what you can do.
whoever owns the property gets to walk away with the property or tell the other person, get out, I don't want you anymore. You can't treat people like that and drive something goes wrong. Brandy and I have set a date and we'll be getting married. Thank you for your ministry. We listen to you every day and I have watched your videos over and over again to absorb all the information because they are so rich in content. On another note, people try to start arguments at least with me at least three times a week from what I am learning from you. Well, they're going to fight you over these truths. The thing that I don't get through, get though, is if even if you walk, walk, even if you walk them through it word by word and show them proof, it's like running up against a wall. That's because they don't have ears to hear. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. If a person can't hear the truth, don't fight them. Leave them alone. Walk away. They just, they just discount the knowledge completely running into like-minded people who love the truth is rare. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Daniel from Florida. We love you, Daniel. Keep writing to us. Chris Jackson writes to us from Reno. He's been watching watches six or seven years, maybe eight. And Chris writes to us, Agape and Phileo, Brother Jim. I watched number 4250, and you had that book about Mardi Gras. People want to know about that. I've got several books on Mardi Gras, but this is the best one I've run across. This man up here. Says Arthur Hardy's Mardi Gras Guide. It's also the same system as Christmas and Easter, as I put in this title up here, and uh, it goes into it goes into King Arthur, the Knights of the Round Table, which were sun and tree worship, and Robin Hood was also sun and tree worship. I'm gonna kind of cover a little bit of that. And all I know to say is write to the city hall in in New Orleans and ask them for this. This book was uh, out. I'm looking, trying to look for the date on it. But it's got the picture of the guy dancing there. That's a party is all it is. I don't see a date. Uh, the 33rd Annual Edition, 2009. Somebody sent that to me. Write to this Arthur Hardy and tell him you want the 3rd Edition, 33rd, 33rd Annual Edition, 2009. And you'll probably get it from him. He's the guy that puts them out. And then uh, Chris goes on to say, uh, what is the name of it so I can get it, please? Also, I bought Mr. Bass's book, Baptizo, and baptism is the, is the change of condition and the mode is irrelevant. If someone gets drunk, they are said to be baptized. They, are, they went from sobriety to drunkenness. A person who is calm and loves loses a loved one, they are said to be baptized, baptizo, with anxiety, fear, and terrible sadness. You are the only teacher I know. Yes, that Jim, that Jim Brown, that Jim Brown, I thought I'd emphasize that, that teaches truth. Thank you, Jim, and Agape and Phileo. Chris Jackson in Reno, Nevada. And then he says, Macrophages, micro, Microglia, uh, macro, macroglia, the three Greek words, macroglia, macroglia cells are Greek and they are glial cells, which is the Greek for glue. They repair the brain and help treat strokes, chronic depression, and so much more. Point being, God gave us these immune systems 
And man, just like he did in Genesis 11 and 4, said, we'll do it our way. That's exactly what they're saying. Since God gave us government and man decided to be his own authority, which is let us make us a name. Name, Shem means authority. I did a massive amount of research and found Jehovah God gave us an immune system that cures, that we know of 6,000 diseases and their viruses, cancer, tumors, Crohn's disease, lupus, multiple sclerosis, and a laundry list of other diseases that number will grow. I can testify that God heals, but not on our command, because I was I was very sick all my life up through my fifties, and uh, I ended up in the hospital at forty five. I believed I was dying of of bronchial pneumonia. Mary believed that we didn't believe I'd come out of that, and. Uh, and I had an encounter with God in the hospital. I mean, I sat up on the side of my bed at this hospital here in Hendersonville, and I looked at it, New Shackle Island Road, and I said, Lord, you're going to kill me if I don't stop trying to be somebody. I was trying to get rich in real estate. I was very capable of doing magnificent things, selling houses. I did crazy stuff. I would loan all the money on my commissions back to people buying a house for two years at a certain interest rate. And they didn't have to pay me anything for two years. And my broker said to me one time, you need to tell people how to sell houses. I said, it's real simple. You just get a great big bag of cotton balls and put a really, just a bare little bit of glue on each one of them and you reach in there and pull them out and throw them at the wall as fast as you can. Finally, something will stick. That's the way I worked. Just the same way I teach in the pulpit. I did everything I could and I would work 85, 90 hours a week until it nearly killed me. Work is good. Overwork is bad. Don't work 60, 70 hours a week. It's worthless. What gets me, people will work. They'll work 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week to get rich and make a lot of money, and they'll make a lot of money. And then they die young because of the stress they're under. When I promised God in the hospital, I said, Lord, I will stop this right now, and I changed like that. I got out of the hospital, and my real estate broker said, he told a builder, he said, something happened to Jim when he was in the hospital. He didn't have any idea. There was a change that come in me, and it, I didn't get well all of a sudden. It took me 10 or 12 years of coughing and hacking, but gradually, slowly, it went away. You don't see me coughing all the time now. I believe God heals when we stop trying to seek self. I believe that. I tell other people that I don't care what you got. I don't care how bad the disease is. Usually our disease is caused by stress, trying to just break our necks being somebody. That's not worth it. Never. Told my doctor, told her, Dr. Lapolis, my cardiologist, I had heart attacks. I've had all kinds of things. That was because I'd weakened my system over all those years. I told him one day, I said, I said, you need, we, me and Mary would go in there. We'd wait three hours to get to see him. I went to his office one day. I said, look, why don't you guys hire some more cardiologists? You, I said, you're rich. You've got plenty of money. He said, well, I don't know about that. I said, I know you're rich. I've driven by your house. And I knew that. All cardiologists are rich. They're about 
five steps higher than a regular MD. To be a heart doctor, that's the big bucks of being in being a physician. But anyway, so much for that. I've got uh, some YouTube comments. Usually these people don't like what I'm saying. <laughs> I think most of them are funny because they don't know nothing about what they're talking about. Uh, T.S. Daily Bible Studies commented on 70 weeks of Daniel, the beast, and talks Epiphanes, the shadow of the man of sin. A sheep's body only is the temple of God. We're the sheep. The Antichrist can't stay inside the body of the sheep. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> We've got an inner man and an outer man. To the Jews, Romans 11, 25, who won't get the call until the last non-Jew does at the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is the, it, that is where in the temple of God, which temple you are, there's a sacrifice offered. That's a false sacrifice. That's the abomination of desolation. We'll be in a literal temple. No, it won't. Anybody who builds a temple and starts offering sacrifices in Jerusalem, that will stink to God. Claiming he's come back from an already dead wound, per Revelation 13, 3, uh, 12 and 14. Jim's great election, predestination, spiritual baptism, etc. But way off on the end times, that's because you're ignorant. I've spent, I started studying the 70 weeks of Daniel in 1964. I've done probably six or eight series on that. The last series I did on the 70 weeks was 18 months on Sunday morning. I still didn't finish it. Why do you young guys try to write me and correct me on something you don't know nothing about because you don't know nothing about it? Prophecy hell way off on demons and devils. <laughs> demons is the word demonion. It means to distribute fortunes. The love of money is the root of all evil. Demons are self. Jesus said so in Mark, the first chapter. Saying they don't exist. What went into the pigs? Self went into the pigs. If you take, if you've gone out of your mind, say, Lord, put into this, put into my dog what's been in me, the dog will go crazy. I said that when I had this band back in the 60s and we were rehearsing in my house down in East Nashville and I was so frustrated, I was shaking all the time because I couldn't get famous. And, uh, and I said to my band, I said, if Susie, my old dog, had in her what's in me, she'd kill herself. I hadn't studied demons to that degree yet. But I knew it wasn't natural for an animal. Jim's great at what he's great at, but horrible at things he's wrong on. You're horrible at things you don't know. You are really ignorant. If you'll call me, I'll tell you where your wealth base, okay? Dark Knight writes, Wrath of man is ordained by God. What brings it in the life of the believer and what removes it? Pastor Brown, I would like to ask two questions. The first being, what does Philadelphia mean in the Greek? That's easy to answer. Philos. A D E L P H O S. Philos means affection. Adelphos is the word brethren. That's why they call Philadelphia the city of brotherly love. But I don't think with all the drugs and the murders that go in there, it's a place of brotherly love. Anyway, so much for that. The first being, what does Philadelphia in the Greek mean? And the second being, who or what is the true Zion? Heavenly Jerusalem. We come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. That's the church of the firstborn. Keep writing to us, Dark Knight. Charlize, Clarice Padley writes, 
Now, on Easter is not in the Bible, part one. Jesus died on Friday. Swastika is the Big Dipper. Thank you, Uncle Jim. <laughs> my name is Clarice Padley. My parents from South Africa in Cape Town, Franz and Estelle van der Vandenberg, members of ours, told me about you. You read one of their letters once before long ago. I love your sermons and enjoy learning the truth about the Bible. I hope to learn more about God, and I want to tell more people about the truth, although sometimes they get angry and they won't listen. Oh, that's me too. I have the same problem. But you can't pay attention to them. If they don't have ears to hear, there's no need to to go any further with them. Walk away. I hope it's not too late for me, as I realize there's a lot I don't know. It's not how much you know, it's whether you believe God or not. I love the Lord, but I am very afraid of Him. Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You're in good shape. I sin every day, me too, because I have little patience, me too. <laughs> well, I got more patience than I used to have because I'm old. However, I will try my best to live by His commandments. Thank you for all your advice. Love, Clarice. Thank you, Clarice. That's a good email. We love you. Keep writing. Then I got this email from, I can't read all of it. It's a full page. But this comes from Yvonne Hickman and David Hickman. And they've been calling us right to us. Dear Jim, Mary, and Grace and Truth Ministries and staff, I'm forwarding an email message I sent to Yvonne and my daughters, our sons-in-law and our siblings. My hope is to further enlighten them of the truth of God's Word. Boy, when you go out to tell your family the truth about Christmas and predestination, 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time they don't want it. My family didn't want it. I have people asking me, how can I get to my mother to believe truth? I couldn't get my mother to believe. My mother was real gentle, real quiet, the softest spoken person I ever knew. And she said, Jimmy, I won't have that predestination. You just don't talk about that around me. I don't know what happened to her. She died a couple years ago. I don't know what happened to my father. They didn't really believe the Bible. He was a preacher and she was his piano player organist. But she didn't like predestination. I don't believe you can hate predestination and be a believer. I just don't believe that. I don't believe you can hate any part of the Bible. When you're wrong on predestination, you're wrong on all the rest of the Bible. Have you noticed that? All the rest of the Bible they're wrong on. They're wrong on salvation, get saved, sinner's prayer. They're wrong on don't accept Christ, they're wrong on tongues, they're wrong on everything. Faith healing, they're wrong on that. Enlighten them with the truth of God's word with respect to false teaching our culture refers to as Easter. Thank you for your faithful feeding of God's sheep as we must gobble up the truth daily for the strength to carry our crosses. In love of Jesus Christ, Dave Hickman. And then he writes, they give us this letter they wrote to their kinfolks. Dearest family members, this memo is intended to provide the truth about the traditions of men that God calls abominations. For most, <coughs> for most of my life, and up to a couple of years ago, I, too, participate in all the abominations of God our culture calls traditional holidays or religious holidays. While I was participating in these holidays, I completely understood the corruption of the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. 
However, I did not understand the corruption of the celebrations them, themselves. God's mercy provided me two faithful ministries that teach biblical truth as I have been drawn to understand his laws. I suggest several scriptural references to verify the truth of God's disgust with men's traditions. Colossians 2.8, Matthew 7, 8, and 15 and 7, and especially the entire chapter of Ezekiel 8, with emphasis on verse 16. Through the Spirit, God is showing Ezekiel the detestable behaviors committed by the house of Israel. And the visions are abominable. They are worshiping the rising sun as they turn their backs on their creator and worship the created. This behavior is a stench in the nostrils of God. It's as if putting the branch they wipe their behinds with to their noses. He learned that from me, and I got it out of out of culture of the ancient world. All this goddess of sunrise service occurred long before the Lord Jesus condescended himself, became flesh, and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. The time of year we need to focus on God of creation being obedient to his laws and turn away from God of men's own minds as the preponderance of humankind worship the other Jesus spoken of in Second Corinthians 11 and 4. And he goes on and finishes up. He says, may it be God's purpose and plan to overwhelm us with shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, with his truth and grace. In love of Christ, dad, brother, and brother and brother-in-law. We love you, Dave. You just keep writing to us. He's been with us for a few months. And I'm going to give you some announcements. We are we're on TV all over the country. I don't know how many stations, 200 and something. And we're on TV in Nashville Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night at 8.30 on Comcast Channel 49. And we're on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And then we're on radio in Nashville, WNQM, every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. And uh, that's 1,300 on the AM dial. And we're on also and down in, in New Orleans, Louisiana, WVOG, every Saturday morning. And uh, we're on the Internet. Needless to say, it goes all over the world. We get response from everywhere. And from all over the United States and from foreign countries. And people, there are few people who love this truth. Not many. Few will find the narrow way. Many will go into the broad way that leads to destruction and hell forever. That's a hard thing to get a hold of. But the Bible says so. Now, we send, we give money to various needy people. These are people that are really struggling, having a hard time with their lives. These are some of them right here. And we, these are some of the people that we send to. We send to Lloyd and the Dab in Philadelphia, Elizabeth Taylor in Dayton, Ohio, Sherry Johnson in Tucson, Arizona. Connie Bonner out in Lebanon, Tennessee. Amanda Meadows in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Danielle Thigpen in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Robin Peters in Amarillo, Texas. Patty Knight in Bethany, Oklahoma. Eli Pratt in North Hollywood, California. And, uh, and Robert Whistler in Ames, Iowa. We send money to Rebecca Rogers. She's the one that her, her water heater went out, and we bought her one, and somehow it's kind of gone on the blink, and we try, I told her we'll 
send you the money if you can get a plumber out to check and see why it's not working. And then Sharon Marshall in Grand Prairie, Texas, Rose Jackson, Lenexa, Kansas, and Kim Pearson in Olathe, Kansas. And we send money to a lady over in Australia who's got cancer. Then Robin Peters has got leukemia in, in uh, Amarillo, Texas. And she's she came up to visit us last week, just a dear, sweet lady. And Wael, her son, is just a very sharp young guy, and he believes the truth. That's very unusual. You don't find many young men in their 20s that really want the truth. Anyway, we, if you want to contribute to these needy people, make your check to Grace and Truth Ministries and put a note on the bottom of it, X amount of dollars for tithe and whatever you want to send to the needy. And be sure and put, you, you can stipulate the needy that you want it to go to. And that's what we do. We, we put this in our benevolent fund in the bank and we've got a considerable amount in the benevolent fund and we give away about $3,000 a month. You want to be a part of that. That is our obligation to the needy. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, that we visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction, philipsis, in their tribulation. Keep yourself unspotted in the, from the world. The fact that we visit the fatherless and the widow in their tribulation, it means these are believers. Well, that'll be enough reading. And, uh, and let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for truth. Lord, help me express these words today that will help these people understand. It will strengthen their faith. God, we, we don't know what to ask you. You know what we have need of before we ask. Give me personal strength to continue this ministry for years to come, if possible. And the Lord will give you the praise for everything. Fight all of our battles for us in Christ's name. Amen. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm talking to you about the unholy days that America celebrates. Today, by their uh, consensus, is Easter Sunday. And it's not Easter Sunday. It never was Easter Sunday. Easter is one time in the Bible in Acts 12. I've said this to you. Acts 12. 
and it says that Peter would be released after Easter. It's not Easter. I said this before. It is Pascha. P-A-S-C-H-A. That word Pascha, every time you find the word Passover in the Bible, it is this word Pascha in the New Testament. It's Passover. It wasn't Easter. I believe that was crept in there by some of the Roman Catholic translators because the New, New Testament was translated from 1605 to 1611. And half the translators were Roman Catholic. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. Some guy wrote me and corrected me and said, well, the chief translator, Lancelot Andrews, was not a Roman Catholic priest. You haven't read a book called God's Secretaries. Good book. Tells you all about the translation and all the fight they had in the translating room for six years. And I don't believe in... I don't believe in the King James Bible. I believe it comes from the correct text, which is an interlinear Bible. This is an interlinear right here. And it has it has the Greek on the top line, the actual Greek of the Textus Receptus, not the West Cotton Hort text where the NIV comes from. And it's got the Greek... And it has the English under it, but I don't even trust the English because that's a translation. I like to go back to the Greek word and get the Greek word and study the word, find out what tense it is, what mood it is, if it's masculine, feminine, neuter, gender, what it is. I don't really believe it. You can say, what about the Tyndale Bible? What about this Bible? What about that? I don't believe in translations. I believe in looking back at the word, the original word, and finding out something about it. That's where you can't go wrong. I've got some things. Most people don't like this title that I've got on the board. Easter, Christmas, Mardi Gras, Valentine's, Halloween, they are all the same thing in different cultures of the ancient world. Yes, Mardi Gras is the same thing as Christmas. It's directly tied to Easter and directly tied to Christmas and to Halloween. They're all the same thing in the ancient world. There is no daily cross, self-denial, or tribulation in these pagan holidays. There's no self-denial. Everybody wants to be nice at at Easter and say Happy Easter, and they don't even they don't even believe in the resurrection of Christ. I had a brother-in-law who passed away, and I gave him. This is what I gave him one time. These are some papers I have written on various subjects. I wrote this on Easter. This is a Easter paper. Got some really good information in it. I wrote this on the major points of Christmas, and I start off and name the points when it was brought into the church and so forth. And then I wrote this, the true story of Christmas. I wrote this about 30 years ago. The true story of Christmas, and I go through the whole thing, and it's uh, it's very interesting. And I gave it to my brother-in-law. He said, you're not taking my Christmas away from me. I said, I don't want to take it away from you. And he was an atheist. He didn't even believe in God. He said, you're not taking it away from me. And then he died. Probably went to hell. Boy, it's a sad thing that people don't want to listen. I'll even read some of these along the way. And I've got something here I just want to share with you. People, who was the general that was head of the South? I can't think of his name. Robert E. Lee. Robert e. Lee, yeah. They have decided to take Robert E. Lee's statues off of everything in the South and take the, the stars and bars, the Southern flag, because they said that they were standing for slavery. 
And Robert E. Lee was a Christian man. He believed in God. He even gave his soldiers time off on Sunday to go to church. And he was a godly man. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who was the head of the forces in the North, he was a drunk, and he ended up being president, and he was an alcoholic. But they want to take all these statues of Robert E. Lee down. Now, I want to know something. I've got a thing here on Benjamin Franklin. And you can get, get uh, Lies My T, uh, excuse me, the uh, Richard Shankman's book on the truth about American history. He's got several books, one called I Love Paul Revere, whether they wrote or not, because he didn't make the full ride. And he wouldn't have been famous if Henry Wadsworth Longfellow hadn't written the poem about him, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. And most of us that took English in high school, we had to memorize a portion of that. And he that's the only place he got fame. And they keep people at the top, and they won't pull down heathens like Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin is on all your 50-cent pieces, and he was a he was a devil. That's what he was. They've even got him on on the Internet. Uh, excuse me. They've got him on TV where they've got specials on A&E about Ben Franklin being uh, the sex addict and how he'd go to had go to Europe and have sexual affairs with women over there. And we got his we got his image on our fifty cent pieces. Let me read this to you about Ben Franklin. Born in Boston in seventeen oh six, Franklin grew up with a new century. For starters he horrified his Puritan parents by becoming a deist. Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson and and George Washington were deists. A deist comes from the word deity. They believed there was a God out there that spun all of this into orbit and our, created our universe. Then he walked away from it and said, we said, y'all take care of it. He was from the South. <laughs> said, you take care of it now, you human beings. Had no, he had nothing to do with it. And Ben Franklin was a deist. D-I-E-S-T. It comes from the word deity. A deity is a god. But they said he had nothing to do with us. And then Ben Franklin was a deist, which meant that he believed in a sort of abstract god, not a bearded Jehovah in the sky in his own words. Since there is in all men something like a natural principle which inclines them to devotion or the worship of some unseen power. Therefore, I think it seems required of me, this is Franklin talking, and my duty as a man to pay a divine regards to something. And as to Jesus of Nazareth, I have some doubts to his divinity. Ben Franklin went straight to hell when he died. Though it is a question I do not dogmatize upon it, I dogmatize that Christ was God. I see no harm, however, in its being believed if that belief has the good consequence as it probably has. It has no good consequence for you, Ben Franklin of making his doctrines more respected and better observed. His doctrines are not respected by the world and better observed. They're hated by most people. He's just a stupid, he was a stupid man. Ben Franklin was. We don't need to give him credit for anything. I'm giving you some things. This is a, this is an announcement from the, the records of the General Court of Massachusetts Bay Colony, Bay 11th, 1640, 1659. This is a notice they had posted there. To the great dishonor of God and offense of others, it is therefore ordered by this court that the authority thereof 
that whosoever shall be found observing any day such as Christmas or the like, either by forbearing of labor, by sopping, working, feasting, or any other way upon any such account, as aforesaid, every such person so offending shall pay for every such offense five shillings as a fine to the county. You could be fined for celebrating Christmas, May 1st, 1659. It was against the law. I got one other thing I want to read to you. This is a, this is a warning. <laughs> I like it. Warning. This world has redefined the word love. Warning. Love now means acceptance of all false religions, tolerance of all sinful behavior, tolerance of false doctrines, refusal to rebuke and expose anyone, never offend anyone with the truth. That's the new meaning of love. I just thought I'd read that to you. Now, I'm talking about Easter. Easter is a lie. They did not have one day a year Mr. Geisler, historian, says they didn't have one day a year where they celebrated the resurrection of Christ. Didn't have that. They at every first day of the week since Jesus' resurrection from the dead, every first day of the week, that Sunday, that's since since Jesus resurrected from the dead on the first day of the week, and the Bible says so. That's what, People have come up with Ellen White, who started the Seventh-day Adventist, that she came up and she said it was one of the popes that said that Chris, that to Easter, now I'll get it right in a minute, that Saturday was changed to Sunday, and that's not true. Even if one of the popes said that, that's not true. The reason we meet on Sunday, when you look at Acts 20 and 7, and 7, on the first day of the week, Paul preached. He was preaching on the first day of the week. And 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. On the first day of the week, when you meet, let every man lay aside in stores, God has prospered him. They met on the first day of the week. That's when they met. Now, there's some things I want to tell you about, about Easter and Christmas. They're all the same thing. You can't get away from one of them. Easter, Christmas, Mardi Gras, they're, they're like a, it's like a straight line from Halloween. You go to Christmas, then you go to Valentine's, then you go to, then you go to Mardi Gras. And that takes you to Easter. They're like one story. That's what it's about. Now, the reason the seasons are the way they are is because the earth is leaning. It's leaning at 23 and a half degrees. That's the reason for the, all of the seasons. As you go... If you'll notice, you got winter up here in the northern hemisphere when it's su summer down in the southern hemisphere. And the same, it's spring here when it's autumn on the southern part of the world. And the same thing here, summer here in the northern hemisphere when it's winter down here in the southern hemisphere. Hemisphere means a half. It means a semicircle. Then you get up to spring. What we're talking about is spring. Spring is the time for harvest. Let me erase this. You've already got that title on the board. Spring is the harvest time of the year. Let me draw it on the board the way I've done so many times. Let me move back to this. If I can get it to move. Come on. No, I need to go forward. 
I hate to go all the way through this. We're going to buy a new one of those. I hope you do. Because this thing won't go the way I want it to go. I'll go back through it. I don't think the top button's working. All right. Y'all need to get one. Get another. I've got to get back to the sun. This has to do with the sun, with the earth being on its axis, leaning. Let me get over here to it. All right. There it is right there. This has to do with the seasons. The sun is not getting smaller through the seasons. The light is getting less light because of the other, the other picture there where the, where the earth is leaning on its axis. When it's leaning away, that's the dead of winter. Winter. What I want to do is put this on the board and explain this to you. What you've got, well, let me make it this way. The sun looks larger. It's not larger. It's not larger. It is just, it's shining less as you get towards winter. It's, this is the sun at its brightest is the summer solstice. And that is June 21st. June 21st is the brightest the sun will be all year long. It's the longest days of the year. But as the earth goes through that orbit, you're coming back around to winter, then what the pagans did, they, as you, get, as you get to the fall equinox, equinox comes from two words, equal night. Now, when you research equinox, some men will say, well, it comes on uh, the m March, you get to, you got two equinoxes. You get back over here, the sun gets to its, to its lowest or the least light at the winter solstice, winter solstice, December the 21st. December the 21st every year. Now, we have 365 days a year. That's an uneven days. So some will say it's on the 22nd. Some will say it's on the 23rd. It's, it's a continual understanding that it's on the 21st. You can move it back and forth. But that means that's the shortest days of the year. You will notice as we get, as we head towards the winter, everything gets, the sun gets, it appears to get darker and darker. Now the pagans thought the sun was burning out. They said we have to do something to pacify the sun god. So when you get at the when you get to the fall equinox, that means equal night. That would be September twenty first or twenty second, because we got three hundred and sixty five days, an odd number of days in a year. Now, I've done a research on the internet and you can find out that in America that as the sun goes past the equal night, that's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. As it goes past this equinox, then you start getting into the dark days of the year. This right here is the light. If you'll notice something, the light days of the year 
start with the with the uh, spring equinox. That's March 21st, give or take a couple of days because of our 365-day year. Spring equinox. Now, when you get to the spring equinox, it gets back here to back to the uh, back to the winter solstice. I can't. I don't have enough room to put it as far as it should go. But when you get to the spring equinox, you either start gaining around two minutes and thirty seconds per day. That's where you start gaining. So light begins to overcome darkness. And I want you to notice something. This is where when you get to March, that's where your harvest begins. The early crops begin to come in in this part of the year. And this has to do with God's covenant with Israel. You've got from the light is stronger at the fall at the spring equinox. This is the season of light right here. Season of light. When you get you, you've got two minutes and thirty seconds as of Washington D.C. time. Some other places in America it would be three minutes per day. So you start gaining three minutes at the spring equinox, and light takes over, and that has you have to have a lot of light to have har harvest. To have harvest, and then you, it takes you down to you get to the summer solstice, and then the sun begins to wane again and get lighter, get darker and darker. When you get to this fall equinox, you start losing. You lose two minutes and 30 seconds a day or three minutes a day, three minutes. So you're going from 11 minutes and let's just say 11 hours and, and 57 minutes. 11 hours and 57 minutes of light. And then you get into the, you get into the, the uh, uh, dark months. Dark months. That has everything to do with what the Apostle Paul said. When you compare the light to the dark. Did not Paul say to the Ephesians, or he said to the Ephesians and the Thessalonians, you were darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord? You were the servants of darkness. And most of the, most of the pagan holidays have to do with with these dark days. And they started in the northern hemisphere, northern hemisphere. So the dark days means you're worshiping Halloween, the feast of Saturn, the Valentines, and it's all in the dark months. Can you see that? I'm trying to paint the picture. What Paul said, you were darkness, but now you're light. Walk as children of light. Well, this, the children of light are the children of harvest. Food, their biggest problem was how are we going to eat? That was their biggest problem. What are we going to eat? They didn't have clothes. They didn't have... Publix, they didn't have Safeway. I say that for people out west. They didn't have those. They had to... And what did God tell them in Deuteronomy 28? He said, If you're obedient to me and you follow after my word, he said, I'll 
Give, I'll increase your storehouses, your baskets when you go out to gather the crops. They'll be full. He said, you'll have more than you could even think of. But if you're disobedient to me, what did Israel do? They went after the gods of darkness. They went after Baal, Grove, Shemash, Molech. All the gods of the Egyptians, all the gods of the, of the Syrians, all the gods of Moab, all the gods of Ammon. These were the gods of darkness. And they, so they, they, they get to, they leave this sun and they come down to the end of the harvest, end of harvest. They had a way of naming this something. They called it, Samhain. And when the Roman Catholics brought it into the Catholic Church, they called that All Hallows' Eve. And they said they had to feed the gods. So they left food out for them. But that was true for Santa Claus. Leave out food for him because the crops are dying. So as the crops were dying when you ended up at All Hallows' Eve at this end of the harvest, the pagans said it was evil gods that was taking the crops down into the ground, the crops down into the ground until this equinox when light began to take over darkness. Light began to begin to increase at the equinox, March 21st, and the first crops start coming in. Can you see that? This is not a hard thing to see. And all of the evil, the evil, they said these gods, gods like sticks. That was the river that you had to cross to go down into Hades. And they said the god Hades and the god Pluto. That was long before he was a dog. They said the god Pluto and Hades and Styx took the crops down into the ground and didn't resurrect them till the spring. Let me give you one thing that's really interesting. Spring or grain begins to take hold at the at the equinox of spring. The green. All these fairy tales were out of sun and tree worship. I've got a book here. I've read this to you before. It's called The Winter Solstice. And it tells you all about these gods. And it's got a section here on Robin in the Green. It's about Robin Hood. Robin Hood was sun and tree worship. That's what it's about. So was, so was King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. They had a movie out, and I made it my point to watch it. I saw it coming on. It was called... The Green Knight. That had to do with getting to the green and going all the way through from the... This was the green time of the time for crops to come in. So God is saying when you go after the darkness, you're going after the gods of Christmas, which is the feast of Saturn. Saturn or the Saturnalia. Let me read this to you about Robin of the Green. It sounds very occultic. Robin in the Green. If you notice, Robin Hood has got on a green outfit. And he has that in the movies. I watched I watched Earl Flynn in Robin Hood the other night, out of 1938. And when I was a kid in the mid-40s, I didn't know Earl Flynn's name, but I thought Robin Hood was our hero. And I just loved 
the old Robin Hood movies, and it had him in a green suit. I didn't ever know when I was a kid what that would have meaning to me as I grew older. It meant Robin Hood. What's amazing, as long as you were obedient to the good guys in Robin Hood, he could go and whip Prince John and and uh, the sheriff of Nottingham, he could beat all of that. But he lived in the Sherwood Forest, a place of the green, and he wore green, and that had to do with the crops. Can you see how all this comes together? And we know it's Roman Catholic because in, in uh, King Arthur, you can go into Hasty's Encyclopedia of Religion. You can look up Merlin. You can look up Arthurian legend. You can look up all these things. And it'll tell you the same thing of what I'm talking about here. It's about light and dark. Let me read this. Robin and the Green. This story's origins derive from the even older Irish tale called Bricou's Feast, where three heroes of Ulster are. This is this just goes back into the Scandinavian world. Those words are very Scandinavian. Ulster are challenged by fearsome giant Kuroy MacDare to a similar beheading game. In the Green Knight, the Green Knight was supposed to cut the head off of one of the knights, Gawain, I believe it was. And they were all, that was a picture of Roman Catholicism. Morgan Le Fay means, I've said this before, Morgan Le Fay was Arthur's sister, and then she was also Morgana, the one he had an affair with to have the illegitimate son that rose up against him at the end of the movie. And and then it had Lancelot was like the savior of, of he was the anti-type of Christ. And when Arthur had the sword fight with Lancelot and he to prove Lancelot and he broke the sword he threw it into the sea and Our Lady of the Lake came up out of the water with the sword in her hand. Lady of the Lake is a Roman Catholic title. We've got Our Lady of the Lake Catholic Church right over here off Indian Lake Road. There's a Lady of the Lake Catholic Church outside of St. Louis, Missouri. I've been through there. They have Lady of the Lake all over. That's an Arthurian legend thing. It has to do everything. All of our imagination is crazy. I've got one book, if I can find it, it's in my library somewhere. I don't know where it is. But it's about all of the fairy tales were written and they were about sun and tree worship. All of them, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, because they said these these heroes of this ancient world, of this ancient darkness, were were sleepers until it came time to wake up and deliver their people. Let me read the rest of this. And then he goes on to say, proving that he is the bravest of three and suggesting that one time he too featured in a struggle between champions of the summer and the winter. That's what Robin Hood was about. In the Robin Hood ballads, we find the same scenario worked out as Robin. The green king of Sherwood. He lived in the green. He wore a green outfit, and that is the color of plants in bloom. Struggles against the polar opposite personified by the sheriff of Nottingham. He represented the dark, trying to destroy the green. Or Guy of Gisborne, you remember him? He's the villain that was that trying to kill Robin Hood. For the hand of the spring maiden, Marion, the spring maiden. She represented the spring. 
for Robin Hood, the green, the man of the green. This was played out every year in various parts of the country. In South Wales, there is a long-standing tradition of a ceremony that is vividly described in the 19th century account. And it goes on and on. It gives much more on that. It's got a little bit of everything, and it's got everything you can think of in here about the winter solstice. There's all kinds of books on this now. Let me get back. I'm trying to explain this thing about darkness and light. You were darkness. You worship the feast of Saturn. That's what Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ's Mass. That's one of the festivals of darkness. When you preachers want to celebrate, that's what you're doing is celebrating the darkness instead of the light. I've got I've got a list of a whole bunch of the biblical these are just some of the light verses. It's this is what it's talking about. Matthew five and fourteen, ye are the light of the world. It's talking about obedience to God. That's how you get crops in the spring. Obedience. Hey. Obedience is the way you get the grain. Not worshiping these gods of the dark. And when you do Christmas or the Feast of Saturn, that's the same thing as Valentine's. That's the same thing as there was a festival from December the 17th through the 24th. And because the winter solstice came on the 21st, they had a seven-day festival. And they had a king of the festival. And the king would reign for seven days. And then he would be killed at the end of the seven days. That's the same thing. The same exact thing as the king of the Mardi Gras. You open up this book and it's got a picture of the king of the Mardi Gras. And well, it's got it, several pictures of it through here. And they've got a, a thing on the king of the Mardi Gras. Well, there he is right there. The king of the Mardi Gras. And he was killed at the end of that. They had to kill one in effigy. That's a fake killing. They killed him in effigy. That's the same thing as the king of the feast of Saturn. I, I don't know why I can find these things and preachers can't find them. Of course, what they did, they would feed the gods at All Hallows' Eve they said that was the God of the dead. It was actually the dead crops. They rose in the spring. And that was just the resurrection of Tammuz. The fish fire god. The sea and fire god of the Babylonians. Tammuz. And we find Tammuz resurrecting from the dead in the 8th chapter of Ezekiel. It, it, it's, it's astounding to me that people... Let me read some of this. And in Matthew 6 and 22, the light of the body is the eye. If your eye be single, your body is full of light. Why do you think God talked about light so much? Let me give it to you. I'm, I'm just kind of throwing these things at you. Go back to go back to Exodus twenty eighth chapter. It's not like this is a mystery. It God put it right out there in front of us. Twenty eighth chapter of Exodus. Do you have to have a lot of bright light to have good crops? Mary grows a garden every year. You gotta have good light. And the light starts to get strong enough for crops to bloom in the spring, in March. That's when it starts. At the 
equinox, at the spring equinox, light gets brighter. That's when the crops start coming in. And he says here in Matthew, in Exodus 28. Excuse me, Deuteronomy 28, excuse me. Deuteronomy 28. And he says, It shall come to pass, if, verse 1, If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings... The blessings have to do with light, being bright. If you're going to have certain plants in a house, we have certain plants in our house. We got windows all across the back of the house. We put them right there in the light. You got to have the lights for plants to grow. They don't grow otherwise. If you put them in the dark, they won't grow. And all these blessings shall come upon thee. And overtake thee if thou wilt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. But Israel did not hearken. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. You'll have healthy babies, healthy children. But if you're disobedient to me, I'll make your kids die. They'll be stillborn. And the fruit of thy ground. How are you going to have fruit of the ground without having bright light? You're not. And the fruit of thy cattle. And the increase of thy kind. And the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shalt thou be. Thy basket and thy storehouses. I'll fill up everything. You wouldn't have to worry about going to Kroger. Or to Safeway. Or to Publix. I'll give you all the food you need. But did they listen to God? No, they went after the darkness. They went after the gods of dark. Blessed shalt thou be when you come out and when you go in. And the Lord shall cause the, thine enemies to rise up against thee. To be smitten before thy face. And they shall come against thee one way and they'll... And they'll flee seven ways. It doesn't matter how many there are. Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass one day by himself. He killed 30 before dinner one evening. And Israel went against 120,000 of the Syrians. At one time. And then camped against them. And Israel only had 7,000 fighting men in Israel. And they whipped them hip and thigh. They killed them. And it didn't matter how many there were. But he says, if you don't obey me. And you go after these gods of darkness. He says in verse 15. Have you noticed how Deuteronomy ties directly with Christmas and Easter and the whole thing? But if it come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments, and Israel did not obey. He said, and keep his statutes, which I commanded this day, that all these curses will come upon thee. You'll be cursed in the city and in your field. Your fields will not yield anything. Well, the reason, one reason they didn't yield because they didn't obey God. God says, I want, I want you to take every seven years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Take a sabbatical year, don't harvest anything, and don't plant anything in that seventh year. And they didn't do that. In America, you have to have crop rotation if you're a farmer out in Kansas or Missouri. You have to, you have, to have crop rotation. I don't know how it works, but you cannot grow every field every year growing the same thing. You can't do it. You'll suck all the nutrients out of the ground. You've got to put certain fertilizer in there. 
and they don't know what to do, so they call a farm agent out, and the guy tells them. He takes the sample of the soil back to his office. They check it. They say, you've got to add this and this and this for these kind of crops. But instead of that, God just tells Israel, every seven years, don't harvest or plant anything. You can find that in the 25th chapter of Leviticus. Read it. Anyway, he says, if you go after these gods of the darkness, which is the only thing they can do, he said, I will devastate you. If I don't send rain, I'll send too much rain. It'll wash your crops away. And they said, don't do that. But they didn't pay any attention to God. They liked the dark better than the light. Have you noticed God's covenant goes right with Christmas and Halloween and Easter? It's all part of the same picture. The first thing they went after was Easter to feed, to feed what they were feeding their dead ancestors, the dead. Because they considered these crops and considered these gods, these evil gods, were stealing their crops. And that the heroes, the good guys, Hercules and, and Perseus and these hero gods, they were actually called heroes. Heroes. And they were delivering the crops and resurrecting the crops come spring. It's all about food. They didn't know how to keep their crops coming in. God says, you don't have to know how. Just obey me. I'll make sure you have plenty of food and you will beat your enemies. This all ties together. It was... I won't go into that right now. Excuse me. And then he says, look over here in Luke 2. Luke 2. Luke, the second chapter. I, this is a, such a huge picture. I can't get it all out in a lesson. I've taught on this before, but I keep thinking if I te keep teaching on it, you'll get the picture. The light and dark is the picture. The darkness is the gods of the world, the gods of the flesh. It's the flesh desiring what it wants to have. Here in Luke 2.32. This is where Simeon comes in and sees me and finds the Christ child and he gets to see it and he's a prophet. And he says in verse 34, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Talking about seeing the baby Jesus. Which... Thou hast prepared before the face of the people a light to lighten the Gentiles. Goodness gracious. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. He's saying, I'm blinding the eyes of the Jews, blind Jews. I'm going to open the eyes of the Gentiles to see the light. And they're going to become children of light, the Gentile church. I don't know how people think that the church is separated from Israel. Not with this kind of a lesson. It's not. In fact, all through the Old Testament, when you, when you read the book of Isaiah, all through that book, Isaiah says, God is going to bring the Gentiles to the light. They're going to be obedient to God. And I'll supply them with spiritual food. Namas is the Greek word law. It means spiritual, legally prescribed food for animals. In our case, sheep. So you can, you can actually tie all the all of the New Testament that says God is going to supply for us, He's going to give us food 
And Jesus says, I have a meat to eat of that you don't know of, he tells his apostle. That is to do the will of my Father. Now look here in, look here in, in Luke 18, Luke 8 and 16. Luke 8, 16. Why do you think Jesus talks so much about the light? Luke 8 and 16. No man when he hath lighted a candle covereth it with a vessel or putteth it under a bed but setteth it on a candlesticks that they which enter may see the light. Light is equated with truth. Remember what John said? Look over here in John. Look at John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by the Word. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was light. And the light was the life of men. The light is truth. Look at John. John 3. John 3. What do you think? Why do you think Jesus talks so much about light and Paul is talking about light? Because the gods of darkness was Christmas or the feast of Saturn, Halloween, Mardi Gras, and Easter. Mardi Gras is directly tied to Easter. Directly. Look here. In John 3, 19. John 3. What is, what is, why is Jesus talking about light? Because it takes light to have crops. We're not talking about literal crops. We're talking about spiritual crops. John 3, 19. <coughs> well, let's back up to... Well, let's go ahead and read 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness... <coughs> Darkness is equated with gods of darkness. They like darkness better than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. They like it. That's why this message that I preach is so unpopular. Men don't like it. They like darkness better. It's more fun to live in the dark. To live darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They have a wickedness about them. They love darkness. And he says in 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Everybody that does the feast of Saturn and Halloween and all of these things, if you, do, if you go along with these things, the rest of your Bible is all messed up. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. He that doeth truth cometh to this light. When you're doing truth, that's the same thing as obeying God in Deuteronomy 28, isn't it? Same thing. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, Look here at, in John 8, 12. Why do you think he talked about light all the time? Because it takes light for crops to grow. For our spiritual crops to grow, the fruit of the Spirit to grow, the fruit of the Spirit is these, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith. Against such there is no law. This is our food. John 8 and verse 12. 8 and 12. 
Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness after the gods of this world. For they shall have the light of life. This is life here where the light shines. From March, beginning of the harvest, to the end of the harvest. September, October. That's where the crops grow. Everywhere in the world, they grow in the light. And then he says, John 9, 5. Oh, you got this everywhere. 9 and verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I'm the light. Spiritual food comes from me. John 11, 9. John 11, 9. Why do you think he says all this in here? John 11 and 9. Let's read 8, 9. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If in men walk in the day, he stumbleth not, but he seeth the light of the world. And if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. It's talking about light opposes darkness. Food versus no spiritual food. Oh, I'm going to have to go to these other places before I lose time. Go over here to Ephesians 5. I'm skipping a whole bunch of these. I've got pages on light all through the New Testament. Ephesians. It's talking about, I'll give you crops. I'll give you spiritual crops. you fight your enemies. I pray that prayer every time I pray, Lord, you fight my enemies. I can't fight anymore. I'm not going to fight. Five and eight. Ephesians 5, verse 8. One of my favorite verses to quote. For you were sometimes darkness. Who's he talking to? Ephesians. You were here in darkness, Ephesian church, but now are ye light. Walk as children of light. You're in the light. You're in the truth. You're not walking after these godless festivals anymore. And it's not just the festivals. If you compromise the festivals, you're compromising everything the Bible says. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, because that's the light. Then you go over here to go over here to look at thirteen and fourteen of that same chapter. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by light, for whatsoever doth might does not doth make manifest is light. And then he says there in verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest. From, wake from the dead, and Christ will give thee light. And then he says here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Well, let's look at Colossians 1.12. Colossians. I've read through this and said this over and over again. Colossians 1 12. Speaking of Christ, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or worthy to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Why do you think he keeps talking about the light? It's the truth. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness under these gods here? That's just self gods, the dark. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's the kingdom of light. And then he says here in 1 Thessalonians 5, look at 1 Thessalonians 5. This goes along with Easter. Because Easter 
comes in the spring at the beginning of light or the beginning of the crops. All right, look here in First Thessalonians 5. Look here in verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that they should, that the day of the Lord shall overtake you as a thief. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But we're not the children of the darkness that that will overtake us as a thief. Ye are the children of the light, verse 5, and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And then he says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love, and for the, and the helmet of the hope of salvation. Now look here in look here in first Timothy six and verse sixteen. Six and verse sixteen. It may take me a couple of weeks or three to go through this on Easter. It's just nothing like what people think. It's the same thing as Christmas, Halloween. And the rest of them. Look here in First Timothy six sixteen six and verse sixteen. Speaking of the believer who hath who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see. A man can approach light. Light has to approach us. It has to shine upon us. That's predestination. And then he says, look at 1 Peter 2 and 9. I'm I'm skipping a lot of these. I just can't get to all of them. 1 Peter 2 and 9. I hope you're beginning to see this, 2 and 9. But we, Paul is talking to the believers. I mean, Peter's talking to believers. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light where he's going to feed you with all the spiritual food you need. But if you forsake God, you put in Christ to an open shame and he's going to bring judgment upon his people. Now, let's keep going here. Look at... Look at 2 Peter 1 and 19. 1 and 19. Talking about the believer. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein do you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. That's the day star was said to be Christ. He was the morning star until Christ the light rises in you. And let's go back over here to Acts 26. Acts 26. You wouldn't think that there was so much importance to the word light, would you? Light is everything that's truth. If God is light in your heart, it's because it was His will to do it because you were one of His elect. Acts 26 and 18. This goes with Isaiah's prophecies. Paul is standing before Agrippa, this Herod, and he's telling him his experience on the Damascus Road. 
And Paul says in verse 14, Acts 26, When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew, dialectos, dialect. It was a dialect of the Hebrew language. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The pricks were an ox goad that was on a, right behind an ox. And if he stalled it would, and he kicked at it, he just hurt himself. He said, Paul, you're just hurting yourself. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of, thine th of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering me from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. I delivered you out of the hands of the Roman soldiers. Now I'm sending you back to them to preach to them. Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles to call them to the light. That's what he said. That's the Gentile church. And to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness, the Gentiles, from these dark worshiping of the other gods. Notice there's very little light. It's dark. Very little light, dark, until they get to the kingdom of light. The Gentiles, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan and God that they may reprove, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance unto them which are sanctified by faith that is in us. Paul said, God sent me to the Gentile church to call them to light and go back to Isaiah 42. Isaiah's whole book is about calling the Gentiles to the light because Israel has turned away from God. Isaiah 42. Forty-two. All through this book he's talking about the Gentiles coming to the light. Forty-two. Verse 1, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit. Is the spirit in the Old Testament the same as the New? Absolutely. The spirit is truth. I put my truth upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And then he says down here in verse 6, Isaiah's message is calling the Gentile church to the light. And the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles, the Gentile church, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison. The Gentiles were in prison in darkness from Adam until Christ and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house now let me get back to where I was let me erase some of this how much time do I have Mike Mike all right. See if I can get Easter in here. Let me see if I can write this down. Of course, you've got you got the light coming to a place of darkness. You got Halloween here or Samhain. You got the festival of Saturn here. Then you have a repeat of Saturn in a sense. This All Hallows Eve was Celtic. That's mostly in England where the Celts were. That's where they that's where they 
worship fairies among the Celts. Fairies. The fairies were the same thing as what the Jews called demons. Same thing that the the same thing that the Arab or the Muslim people called genies. Genies. Genie comes from the word gene that was their ancestors. The Jews said demons were their ancestors. They called their ancestors by D A I M O N I O N. Daemonion was what the Jews called demons. That was their ancestors that distributed fortunes. You got three wishes from a genie. Fairies distributed gifts to you. That was in England. So when so when the Feast of Saturn came for seven days and the king of the Feast of Saturn had to die, then when you get down here into this all, the Celtics, that had to do with the death of the crops and they called it gods that were killing their crops until spring or until the time of the grain. That's how they represented the evil gods, they'd call them the gods of the grain. That's what Robin Hood was called. That's what that knight of, out of King Arthur, the green knight, was the king of, was the knight of the grain. And he was going to bring the grain back to, you can, they got this in movies. You can actually watch it in movies. It's crazy. And yet, people say, I think it's okay to do Easter. So when you got to February the 1st, not February 1st, February 7th, the 7th through the 14th, since there were 365 days every year, 360 days in the Jewish calendar, always this February the 7th through the 14th, that was, the 14th was called Fat Tuesday. In the French, that is the word Shrove Tuesday or the French would say Mardi Gras. And what they would do, they would feast for seven days just like seven days on the here in Rome, the Feast of Saturn. And these were the French or the Franks this was their form, their form of the Feast of Saturn. They would feast for seven days. They would have a king of the Mardi Gras. And then he would die just like this man would die at the Feast of Saturn on the last day. And this king of the Mardi Gras would die. You got everything in the same, in the, in the Mardi Gras you had in Christmas. It was a wild, debaucherous, wicked, sexual orgy. That's what it is. That's what, that's what the Feast of Saturn was. People say, I think Christmas is okay. You mean Jesus wants his name on an ancient orgy? No. I don't care what you preachers say out there. What's wrong with you? The Bible says, therefore shall you keep my ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. In that verse in Leviticus 18.31, it doesn't say don't worship their gods. God says don't worship their gods in other places. But he said in that verse, don't do what they did. If you do what they did, you're going to be found to be a liar, according to Proverbs, the 30th chapter. You can't add or take away from the Word of God. Christmas and Easter and Halloween are all the same thing, and they're adding to the Word of God. So what they would do, on the 14th, 
that was Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday, they would glut and stuff themselves for those seven days with everything that they wanted, particularly that king of the Mardi Gras. He had all the sex he wanted. He had all the food he wanted. He just glutted and stuffed himself, and then on the seventh day, he had to die. And then they would start mourning on the 15th. Start mourning. They'd mourn for 40 days. The Roman Catholics brought that into the church, into the Roman Catholic Church and called it Lent. They brought that 15th, which came on a Wednesday, and called it Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. And they started mourning and they at Lent they give up something. Give up. Usually something they don't like, like like uh, some vegetable they don't like. Brussels sprouts. I'm gonna give up Brussels sprouts for Lent. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not what that was about. What that was about, and they would mourn for 40 days, and it would end on March 25th. March 25th was the day of Annunciation. The Roman Catholics brought all this into the Roman Catholic Church. The day of Annunciation On the day of Annunciation, that was exactly nine months before the birth of the Son God at the winter solstice. The winter solstice would repeat itself, and on December the 25th, that was the birthday of the Son God, particularly Mithra at Rome. You can look in McClinic and Strong and look up Mithra. It'll say the most prominent day in Rome was the birthday of their Son God, Mithra, and that was December the 25th. That's why they took this. That's why Pope Jews the I took that birthday of Mithra and assigned it to Jesus as his birthday. That's the wrong Jesus. That's the wrong day. And he would, and they would mourn all those 40 days. And the Roman Catholics brought in the Ash Wednesday and brought in the 40 days, changed it to Lent, and it ended on March 25th where they announced the birth of the pregnancy of the Son God will be born nine months later on December the 25th. And you're right in the middle of the Feast of Saturn one more time. And that happened year after year after year. And the Son God was born again and again and again. That was called reincarnation. That was the birth of the Son God over and over and over again. i got to give you what Israel was doing. It's my favorite thing to show you in Ezekiel. Go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the 8th chapter. Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel was in the captivity already. He was... Ezekiel... Babylon had carried Israel because of this sun god and tree worship they did. They were carried over into Babylon... Southern Judah was carried to Babylon in 586 B.C. When they were in Babylon, there were three deportations by God. God put it in the hearts of Nebuchadnezzar to come in and carry Israel away in 605, 597, 
it's these were peaceful deportation. It is believed that Ezekiel and Daniel were carried away in the 597. So Ezekiel is over here in Babylon, 650 miles away from Jerusalem. 650, approximately about that. He's in Babylon. God is having showing him visions of what's going on in Israel and why he's going to destroy Israel in 586. He's showing him why. And that's what's happening in this eighth chapter. This is the real picture of Ishtar. Here in verse, in chapter 8, verse 7, let's read some through it. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, he's talking about the court of God, he's talking about the temple. That's what he's talking about. Here's the brazen sea. Here's the, here's the altar where they offered the sacrifices. There's the veil. Here's the Ark of the Covenant. There's the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the seven candlesticks. These were beaten gold. These were brass here. So he's going to tell you what's happening in Israel. They were inside a court. It was enclosed in a court. There was a door up here. And I said, And they said to me, Son of man, dig now in the wall which I digged in the... When I had digged in the wall, behold a door. Here. He's up here. He's going to look in and see what's happening. He's over here in Babylon. God is picking him up in a vision and showing him what's happening in Israel and why he's going to do what he's doing. God is carrying Israel away into captivity because for 500 years they went after that, those gods of darkness. They went after Baal and the grove and Shemosh and Molech and all the rest of them. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel. They've got them on the sides here. They've got, I don't know how they had them, if they had them on the sides of the temple. Portrayed upon the wall round about. Maybe it was all over. Israel was worshiping these gods. In the house of God. They were defiling God's house. He, they didn't have any commandments to do that. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel in the midst of them and stood Jezaniah, the son of Shephan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up, and he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel? He's not talking about pagans. While Ezekiel is over here, God takes him into visions. He's showing him what Israel is doing. What the house of Israel do in the days, every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, the Lord don't see what we're doing. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He doesn't know we're worshiping these gods that's in the walls around, around the temple of God. Maybe they got them in the sides of the temple. God don't see. And what did he promise them in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy? If you go after other gods, I'm going to destroy you. America's going after these same gods, aren't they? It's, you know what it is? It's the God of self. I like an easy gospel. I want to celebrate Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter egg. Little bunnies. The reason the bunnies are associated with Easter, Easter was a fertility goddess. It's all about fertility. The egg was about fertility. It's all the worship of Noah. They said he came out of a big giant egg. 
That was what the ark was supposed to be. <clears throat> and it was a red stained dye. It was a red caulking. And the original Easter eggs were red. And he said also unto me, Turn thou again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that, they, that Israel is doing. Why do you think he scattered them? Because they were celebrating Easter. It says so right here. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, that 40-day that 40-day Lent that they brought in the church, in the Catholic church, was the 40-day weeping for Tammuz. And Tammuz was resurrected in mythology on that March 25th, the day of Annunciation. Their God was all these different gods. And it was the same God over and over and over again. There they went, women moved from Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man, Ezekiel? Have you seen what Israel's doing? I told them not to do this. Turn thou yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Brought me into here. This is the inner court here. It's the inner court of where it's set off. And only Levites can come in here. That's the third son of Jacob, third. Only Levites can come in there. This is what the Levites are doing. The women were weeping for Tammuz for 40 days. And then he's resurrected on that March 25th. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, right here, somewhere, this is Solomon's porch right here, somewhere around this neighborhood right there, there's 25 men. At the inner court of the Lord's house, behold the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar, somewhere in this neighborhood, between the altar and the porch of Solomon. And the altar, there were about five and twenty men, twenty-five men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord. The temple faced east. This was west, north, south. With their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and they faced the east and worshiped the sun toward the east. They were having a sunrise service 600 years before Jesus was even born. Sunrise service. It's the stupidest thing in the world. My father used to have sunrise services. We'd get up before the sun come up and go out to the church. It's, it's paganism. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Absolutely zero. You think uh, preachers want to study this and find out about it? You think they know what light means? You were light, you were darkness. He's telling the Gentile churches, you were darkness, but now you light in the Lord. Walk as God's children of light in that time period where it's light from during the harvest season where everything is green. It has nothing to do with Robin Hood or the green night. Nothing. That's something they made up. If I'm not telling the truth, there is no truth. Because you're going to find these same things in the McClellan and Strong and the Hastings Encyclopedia. You can find it in the fairy tale books. I've got a bunch of books on fairy tales, and it says all the fairy tales are about sun and tree worship, and that's what God destroyed Israel for. 
America's living in a fairy tale. You know that? Christmas is a fairy tale. Easter's a fairy tale. Halloween's a fairy tale. They all, they mix up their culture and their customs. They would lay food out at Halloween. That's the same thing you do at Christmas when you lay food out for St. Nicholas, a Roman Catholic bishop of the 4th century, so he has something to eat because there's no food. It has died at the end of the harvest until Tammuz is raised again in the spring. Tammuz was just a fertility god. Notice how all these fertility gods crisscross with each other. And and you had the same festival among the Franks where they had where you started Halloween. Excuse me, you started actually with Mardi Gras did nothing but reach towards reach towards Easter Easter. It, all it did, it, it began the last day of Mardi Gras, and then the next day they start mourning for Tammuz until for 40 days until you get March the 25th, and that's that's nine months before the before the beginning of of the feast of Saturn one more time, which was back here. It was over and over and over again, the same thing. I hope I've made this fairly clear. I don't know if I did. There's so many issues of it. It just goes in every direction. I want to please God, not man. I don't care what men say about what I teach. I don't know why I can see this and other preachers can't see it. I don't understand. I can see it if you go into enough detail, you're going to see the truth about Easter. Easter's Ishtar is an ancient English goddess that they stuck in there in the translation. Do I have any time, Mike? No. I may come back and do some more on this because i got to go through all of these verses on the Gentiles coming to the light, coming to this, this, the light is the time of harvest. Do you see that? That's fairly simple. The light ends, it starts with the, with the, autumn, with the spring equinox, they call it the vernal equinox, the R-N-A-L. Call it the vernal equinox. It means the spring equinox. Starts with the vernal equinox, and it goes to the ec- the end of the harvest, which is in September, October. And those are the those are the feasts of God. It starts with the Passover, fifty days later. It's got you got Pentecost, and the feast of in gathering is the 10th day of the 7th month, our September, October. The, what he's saying, you've got to celebrate my festivals. They're spiritual now. And that's the time of the green. I hope you can see that. Just remember the green. If you see that movie come on TV, it's <laughs> The Green Knight. I don't remember who starred in it. But I saw one with which is named the British actor that did James Bond, uh, Sean Connery. He had one where he was the Green Knight. That's the God of the Green. It's the same thing as Robin Hood, Robin Hood of the Green. I'm out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these truths. I don't know if I explain this correctly or not. Lord, help me to clarify this to the people that we're the children of the light. We're, not, we're to walk as children of light and in repentance and in obedience to your word. Thank you for truth. Cause us to continue your work and make us to stand true at all times. And we'll praise you for everything. Glorify you. Fight our battles for us, Lord. We can't fight no more, Lord. With this message, people want to fight us. We don't want no fights. 
Just call, give us strength to say the truth, and we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I feel like there's so much to this. here? Well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, she's watching her mother, and they kill her mother in a home. You know that. Yeah. And she's watching you all the time. Okay. Just thought it'd be nice. It'd be good for her. Thank okay. you. Hi, sweetheart. Uh, somebody to talk to you here. Just a Hey, Cody. How you doing? How's your mom doing? Well, that's a part. Getting old is a part of living. Isn't it? How are, you, are you getting along okay? I just wanted to say hi to you. And we love you. We love Dwayne. And we're glad y'all are part of this ministry. Okay, you take care. I'm going to give you back to Dwayne. We love you, okay? Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, I was gonna bring my bee pollen. I gotta take it in front of people in case I got any rush to the emergency. Room. In case I get anaphylactic, whatever you call it. Is that what it's called? Thanks, really you know, like, I, didn't, I didn't understand your text the other day. Oh, just about. Oh, this is what they do. 